The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. From the University of Maryland, this is Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff. America is in financial trouble. The national debt is skyrocketing. Savings rates are low, and there aren't enough younger workers to finance the retirement of millions of baby boomers leaving the workforce in the coming decades. Do our leaders understand the problem, let alone what to do about it? To find out, Policy Watch is joined this week by Peter G. Peterson, former Secretary of Commerce under President Nixon, and author of the best-selling Running on Empty how our Democratic and Republican parties are bankrupting our future, and what Americans can do about it. Peter Peterson, welcome to the University of Maryland and Policy Watch. First, a little background about you. You're the son of immigrants? Yes, I'm the son of Greek immigrants. My parents came over when they were in their teens without a word of English and without a penny. My father took a job no one wanted as a dishwasher on the caboose while they were building the Union Pacific Railroad. He uh, <clears throat> lived on the caboose and saved everything he made, and he built the inevitable Greek restaurant, not known for its cuisine, I can assure you, but for the fact that it was open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And my father and mother were there <clears throat> much of that time. And they were the uh, enthusiasts for the American dream. And the idea was that uh, there was nothing more important for them, as my father used to say, we want to buy the best education money can buy. So my story is kind of the lucky recipient of the American dream. And happily, there are many of us. Yes. We were just talking before we started that uh, my grandmother came, same situation. My mother was born abroad, and uh, in this country at least, um, the Greeks and the half-Turks are talking to each other. So, welcome. Where, where, where did you grow up? In the middle of Nebraska, middle in of a Nebraska. town called Kearney, Nebraska, which <laughs> was certainly not the intellectual center of the world. But it was the geographic center of, of uh, America, 1,733 miles to Boston and 1,733 to San Francisco. That's its only claim to fame that I'm aware of. And then your parents sent you to school. Right. Was that the University of Chicago? I did my undergraduate work at Northwestern and my graduate work at University of Chicago. And graduate work in? In the business school. And I taught there for five years part-time at night. Aha. What did you teach? I taught marketing, or tried to, and uh, that university had a profound effect on my life because it was there that I met uh, George Schultz, who was the dean of the school, and he's the one that called me one day and said, the president wants to see you tomorrow. So I'm in the Oval Office, and the president is explaining to me how Economics is going to be the future of foreign policy. And now Henry Kissinger didn't know much about economics. And he didn't know what he didn't know or some such comment. I couldn't quite understand why he was telling me all this. This was Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon. And uh, the next thing you know, uh, he said, you're going to take this job because I need an economic advisor and you're going to do it. Well, I was CEO of the Bell & Howell, which is a good-sized company and making a lot of money. But I was very favorably inclined, and uh, I called my father to ask him about it. He says, of course you have to take it. He said, God bless America. And he used to run around the, the world saying, my name's George Peterson. He said, my son is Peter. He says, you know, he's the first and only Greek cabinet officer in the history of America. I don't know if I should bring this up in Maryland, but he he forgot Spiro Agnew, uh, who had a higher job, as you may recall. 
Now, in your book, you talk about trade. But in those days, when you were Secretary of Commerce, did you ever think that 30 years later, America's trading position and condition would be, shall I say, as bad as it is today, that we'd be running the kind of trade deficits that we're now running? Well, I don't know that we panicked, but we sure got concerned. And you may recall, we closed the gold window and had a summit meeting at Camp David and did all sorts of things. I think we had a $7 billion trade deficit. Today, it's over $500 billion. And even adjusted for inflation, that's a 15-fold that's a increase. increase. And we now have to borrow over $2 billion every workday, recklessly in my view, to finance these deficits. Um, at the risk of touching a sore subject, you, you used to head Bell & Howell. Bell & Howell, did it become, was it a uh, victim of our trade situation? May have been a victim of my management. No, <laughs> no, no. no. Uh, it uh, it went private, as it were, and it's still still in business. But um, <clears throat> it was a victim of the technological revolution. You remember in the old days, you had eight millimeter movie cameras, and you'd buy a container of film, and editing it was next to impossible, and uh, splicing it was very difficult. It didn't have sound. Now you've got something called videotape. So it was really outdone by a technological revolution. And they're now in other fields. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess the, and it was the Japanese who came in. Why? In so many areas of American manufacturing, it seems as if either the Japanese or someone else um, took the technological leap before we did, at least in the 70s and 80s. Why was that? Well, I don't know that they took a technological leap. They, they had a huge cost advantage. Uh, when I was at Bell & Howell, we were paying uh, something like $1.80 an hour, and they were paying $0.25 cents an hour. And with the new communication revolution, it was quite easy to learn the technology. But they essentially outproduced us on a cost basis. That was the main reason they succeeded. Let me turn to your book. Mm -hmm. Actually, books. In preparation for our discussion today, uh, I looked at the list, and the titles are Gray Dawn, Will American, uh, Will America Grow Up Before It Grows Older, Facing Up, and Borrowed Time. I think I notice a common theme in these books. Well, you know, I get kidded a lot about my books. Ted Sorensen, who was pre President Kennedy's assistant, roasts me all the time. His comment about Grey Dawn, he said, Grey Dawn is a book that once you put it down, you won't be able to pick it up. <laughs> so I couldn't wait to hear what he said about this one. <laughs> so he said, running on empty. When I read it, he said, I assumed it was your autobiography. <laughs> so I'm a masochist. I enjoy getting assaulted by my best friends. But there is a theme to these books. There sure is. And it is? that we're not really thinking very much about the future. And we've become a um, all get, no give, all gain, no pain, uh, win elections at any cost, and pass the bill on to our children. And since my life is a lot about the American dream, and I have nine grandchildren, five children, I think a lot about what we're doing to them. We're slipping them a huge check for our free lunch. We're slipping them unthinkable taxes. My grandkids' payroll taxes would have to double <coughs> to cover Social Security and Medicare. We're passing on to them $74 trillion of unfunded liabilities in today's dollars, which is much more than the entire net worth of the America. So I know it sounds self-serving and sentimental, but I'm concerned a great deal about our kids and grandkids and what we're doing to them. And I think it's important to, to, to understand the enormity of the debt. For the past few years, many commentators have criticized the Bush tax cuts, and indeed they've been 
large in the trillions. But as you've said, the real issue is the entitlements. Those tax cuts, immense as they seem today, are only a tenth, right, of this ongoing long-term no, debt we have. There's not a politician alive today, <clears throat> however wise the particular tax cuts may or may not have been, who's recommended getting rid of all of them. All that John Kerry is recommending is getting uh, rid of the tax cuts on fat cats like me and perhaps you. But even if you got rid of all of them, it's only about 10% of the problem. And the melancholy reality is there should be a new headline, not the it's the economy stupid, it's the entitlement stupid, is that we're going to have to engage in benefit reduction. And in this world we're living in, the idea that somebody might give up something is not only politically incorrect, it's political suicide. And I have a contrarian view. I must have had a thousand people after writing this book who said, isn't it a crime that the politicians aren't making this a major issue and proposing their solutions? And I say, be careful what you wish for. Because in Nebraska, we used to have something called the turkey shoot. And the poor turkey that lifted its head got shot off. Well, the political turkey in a political campaign who would stand up and say, <clears throat> here's what I think we ought to do about entitlements. We should gradually increase the retirement age or we should have an affluence test or something like that, would not only get his head shot off and be called cruel and inhumane and so forth, but what would happen is they would take positions in response to that that would make the reform process all the, all the more difficult. So when you hear John Kerry saying, I will not increase retirement age, or I will not increase taxes, uh, that isn't really a, con <coughs> a contribution to the problem. It becomes the problem. So what I've been recommending is they ought to tell the American people this is a very large problem. It's going to have to be dealt with on a global basis, on a presidential basis, on a bipartisan basis. And here's the process I'm going to use to solve it. Not the solutions, but the process. And the process would be a 9-11 type commission of that quality, not special interest devotees, but people like Paul Volcker and Bob Rubin and uh, Senator Nunn and Senator Rudman and Alan Simpson and people of that quality who really understand the national interest. The president would announce such a group immediately after getting elected. He'd put them on a rather tight time frame. And they would report to the country because what this country needs is a massive dose of truth-telling. For example, uh, we not only have uh, amnesia, we have anesthesia politically. And for example, we've come up with an oxymoron uh, called the trust fund. And I've collected oxymorons ever since someone called me a powerful Secretary of Commerce. And I burst out laughing because I knew there'd never been one, you know. But I think the trust fund belongs in the upper tier of oxymorons. It shouldn't be trusted and it's not funded. And the same thing about lock boxes? Yeah, lock boxes another... it got unlocked very quickly, didn't they? I thought, and, let me interrupt you for a second. On, on that question, for a short, glimmering moment, we were running current account surpluses, current surpluses in the federal expenditures. And we were all quite proud of ourselves and so forth. But in fact, those surpluses were only because we were taking the money from the Social Security trust funds, right, to pay current bills. You got it. When they set up Social Security originally, you may recall under Franklin Roosevelt, it was supposed to be a safety net for the truly needy. The politicians have never met a surplus they can't spend. And when you have a fast-growing workforce of boomers paying in taxes, you have huge temporary surpluses. The theory had been that that money would be set aside. But when the politicians saw 
hundreds of billions of dollars. They, they just couldn't resist uh, the temptation, and they spent it. But not for retirement benefits. They spent it for everything else. So the only thing that's in the trust fund now is a bunch of liabilities. And whether you have a trust fund or not is, pragmatically speaking, irrelevant, because you still have to do the same thing. You either have to cut the benefits, you have to increase taxes, or you have to borrow the money. Now, how much would you have to borrow, just so everybody understands this? In business, we have the idea of cash flow. These are pay-as-you-go systems. The, re the taxpayers pay in and the money goes out to the retirees. The cash flow deficit in last year was $25 billion for Social Security and Medicare. It's going to be $785 billion only 15 years from now, deficit. It's going to be in the trillions thereafter. Oh, we'll just borrow the money from the Japanese and now the Chinese. Well, the problem is the uh, Japanese uh, have an aging problem that's more serious than ours. And now that you mention the Japanese, I tell the anecdote in the book of uh, a discussion with Mr. Kuroda, the Vice Minister of Finance. And I said, Mr. Kuroda, Japan had a big problem with aging society. You live longer than any country in the world, and your birth rate is only 1.3 babies per woman, and you're going to lose 25% of your workers under the age of 30 in the next 10 years. Is that a big problem? Oh, my, yes, Mr. Peterson, very big problem. How are you going to finance that problem, Mr. Kuroda? Well, he says, unlike you, we have a big savings rate, and we have a current account surplus, so we can use that for a while. I said, Mr. Kuroda, you're financing 25% of our current account deficit. Have you figured out a way of spending the same money twice? He says, ah, very difficult problem. <laughs> and you see, what we fail to recognize, and that's why it's so reckless, that for us to be depending on over $2 billion every workday of foreign capital, when they have much lower birth rates, are living as long as longer, have more generous programs, already have payroll taxes of 35% of pay in Europe, for us to depending on that source of capital to finance our deficits is reckless. You've talked, you talk in the book about, in effect, uh, the best possible scenario and the worst case. You call it a hard landing and a, almost a soft landing. Tell us the worst first. What, what, what's the worst case scenario? Well, you've just had lunch. It might be difficult for you to digest this, but I'll try. Um, the hard landing or crash landing, it's called, goes something like this. For a variety of reasons, some very hard to predict, because no one knows when this landing will take place. Foreigners lose confidence in the American economy and the dollar, or they have very pressing needs at home, or something of that sort. If they do it suddenly, which is what the hard landing's about, the dollar falls steeply, Interest rates have to rise steeply. This is like a run on the bank. Yeah, right. And um, then you have very nasty effects on financial markets and the economy. And finally, a slowdown and some inflation. That's the hard landing. The softer landing is more gradual. The same things happen. The dollar falls and interest rates go, but, mu but more gradually, giving us time, more time uh, to adjust. Now, the bottom line here is not only the United States has to change its ways, but the rest of the world has to change its ways. Because you can't continue running deficits abroad of 6% of the whole gross uh, uh, domestic product. So. What has to happen? And boy, what a change this is, because we have become, we've gone from being the biggest saver in the world to the biggest consumer in the world. And we have the lowest savings rate of any developed country. And in only 15 years, it's fallen from 5 or 6 percent, the GDP down to less than 1 percent. 
we're going to have to consume less. We're going to have to save more. We're going to have to export more. And there comes the rub. The rest of the world has gotten addicted and hooked on financing their growth by exports to the United States. So they're going to have to do the opposite. They're going to have to consume more and they're going to have to import more and export relatively less. And trust me, my friend, these are very major changes in the uh, political culture. And as you suggested, the demographics of many of our major trading partners are not only no better, but quite worse than ours. Well, let's look at Italy. Not to be sacrilegious, but I've been thinking of talking to the Pope about this. They have the lowest birth rate in the developed world. He's trying. He's trying. <laughs> they have 1.2 babies per woman. Uh, it takes 2.1 babies to keep population stable. Over the next 40, 50 years, they're going to lose 40, 50 percent of their workers. And they're presented with a huge problem. Their enthusiasm for immigration in Europe, particularly from the Muslim countries, is, shall we say, restrained. So th these are very major problems that we're talking about when we're talking about rebalancing uh, the world. But these trends are simply not sustainable. And in the Nixon administration, we had a Nixon humorist, which will strike some people as an oxymoron, Herb Stein, who used to say, if something's unsustainable, it tends to stop. And he said, if you don't like that one, if your horse dies, we suggest you dismount. <laughs> so the question is how you get off this horse. Do you get thrown off or do you, you know, get off gradually? And that's why I think the next president really has to take the lead in a global solution to the entitlements problem. Because this is a global problem if I ever uh, saw one. Now it's the time uh, for us to turn to our audience for their questions of you. Uh, but thank you very much. You behaved like a benign Turk. I'm glad to see that. <laughs> Old animosities die hard. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Secretary. I'm Matt Gessler. I teach uh, public policy. I always cringe when they say Mr. Secretary because I don't know what's coming next. You know? <laughs> Watch out. The, uh, I mean, and I have the honor of spending one day a week at the in the Peter G. Peterson building, which houses the Institute for International Economics. Yes, uh, the, uh, my question is this. Uh, it's one thing if politicians, as you suggest, don't dare talk about this because they might get their heads shot off. It's another question if they, whether they understand it or, to be, or if one want, has an even lower uh, standard of reassurance, whether people close to them or senior in their entourages understand this problem and might possibly be in a position to nudge them toward the type of uh, process solution you suggested the day after the election. Uh, without naming any more names than you want to name, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about whether you think there are people in the senior who have access to the president and the would-be president who would be in a position to put, this, to put these ideas forward, and also whether you think the, pres the candidates themselves might have some intellectual grasp of this, even if they aren't ready, anywhere near ready to face it politically. Thank you. Well, I quoted Lady Thatcher. She argued the leaders certainly did know uh, what the problem is. I can't say that they go out on the television and say this, but you would be, I think, encouraged by the huge numbers of senators and congressmen that say, Pete, I read your book, and God bless you. You keep getting that story out there because it's an important story. I think the politicians know more than uh, they pretend that they know. This guy's going to call me an optimist, but the, the reason I think there's at least a shot if you put a real commission together of this quality is this next president has a different issue on his mind, I think, than 10, 20 years ago. This problem is going to start hitting on their watch. This is no longer this, uh, the boomers start in five years. This is no longer this far off thing. 
And since you're at the Institute, you know all about hard landings and so yeah, forth. Yeah, the international side. If I were uh, the next president's economic advisor the way I was to Richard Nixon, I'd walk in and say, Mr. President, there's no one alive that can tell you precisely what the odds are. But let me tell you, the risks are considerable that during your term, there could be a real aneurysm here. And do you want that to be your legacy? Do you want to become the Herbert Hoover of the uh, 21st century? So I think there's a shot here that uh, the, the enlightened self-interest, shall we call it, might take over. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, we have to draw this segment of Policy Watch to a close. We'll continue with our discussion in the next segment about what the programmatic changes uh, should be to get us on a better course. So for now, Peter Peterson, author of Running on Empty, thank you very much for being at the University of Maryland and Policy Watch. Thank you. Thank you. This program was produced by the University of Maryland, which is solely responsible for its content. The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. We are PBS.